Well, welcome back, everybody. We are here with our good friend, uh, mentor, teacher, uh, neurologist, four times New York Times bestselling author, grain brain, brain maker, his new book, The Grain um, Brain Whole Life Plan. Uh, he also has a cookbook, which uh, Tan and I are huge fans of. So welcome back, David. Delighted to be back with you guys. So in this episode, let's talk about Brain Maker. And we, we started to talk about the gut-brain connection. Who would have thought in my psychiatric training at the Walter Reed Army Medical Center, not one lecture on the gut-brain connection, but the lining of the gut actually has some similarities to the blood-brain barrier, the lining of the brain. And if one is troubled, it tends to be the other may become troubled. How did you get interested in this? Well, like yourselves, uh, I've uh, been a bit of a disruptor <laughs> and <laughs> was never satisfied with the status quo. You know, Ronald Reagan told us that status quo is a Latin term for the mess we're in. And uh, oh, we're I love that. working in the neurosciences, it's a mess. Uh, you know, 5.4 million Americans diagnosed with Alzheimer's, a number that's supposed to triple by the year 2030. And we have no treatment. We have no cure. So, you know, I have been kind of led to believe that if you want to cure Alzheimer's or at least reduce it uh, or MS or any neurologic condition, you should be looking at the brain. Well, there weren't any answers there. And it turns out uh, that we now uh, have to take a step back and take a deep breath and realize that the origin of these diseases may well be in the gut, not in the brain. That's what motivated me to write this new book, uh, Brain Maker, because it's all about the gut. It's all about what we learned from Dr. Hippocrates a few years back when he told us that all disease begins in the gut. The reason that's so much more empowering is because we know that we can highly influence what goes on in the gut. You know, making the connection between our lifestyle choices and our brain and brain function and brain's destiny is a bit of a stretch for many people. And frankly, it was a stretch for me. But when you look at brain health and brain health destiny in terms, uh, rather through the lens of the gut, uh, then suddenly you realize that indeed there is not just a connection, but more importantly and more empowering, there are leverage points. There are places where we can intervene to have profound impact and change a person's destiny. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier in an earlier uh, interview, uh, the, the cardinal feature of all of our dreaded brain degenerative conditions is a mechanism called inflammation. Inflammation is regulated by things that go on in the gut. Most importantly, uh, it is highly influenced by the adequacy or the patency of the gut lining that segregates things that are inside the gut from things that are then in the rest of the body. And make no mistake about it, that's one cell lining thick. That's pretty, pretty narrow uh, fence that, that segregates these two areas. And uh, Dr. Amen, as you mentioned, the same situation is in the brain. We call it the blood-brain barrier. It's very interesting to look at uh, the research as of late that demonstrates that some of the same uh, environmental issues that challenge the gut lining and lead to increased leakiness and therefore increased inflammation do exactly the same at the level of the blood brain barrier. So we know that our gut bacteria play, in a, play a very important role in regulating both the permeability of the gut lining and the permeability or lack thereof of the blood brain barrier. So when we talk about the, the concern and the, uh, the threat that having a leaky gut might present, let me tell you, a leaky brain is not necessarily gonna be a party that you wanna attend. But <laughs> fortunately, uh, these uh, same factors are at play that regulate both of these. And what the research is telling us now is that a certain short chain fatty acid by the name of butyrate, uh, it comes from a Greek word that has to do with butter, that's where it came from. This is created by healthy gut bacteria. Butyrate tends to heal the gut lining and does exactly the same uh, at the blood brain barrier level. 
So we have got to do our very best to keep the gut bacteria diverse and we've got to restrict things from our lifestyle choices that can threaten the diversity of our gut bacteria. The gut bacteria that we have is very sensitive primarily to our food choices. Mm -hmm. So what I've just done is I've connected our food choices to the health and diversity of our gut bacteria, to their ability to make this chemical butyrate that then will heal the gut lining and reduce this mechanism, inflammation, which is the cornerstone of well beyond brain degenerative conditions, but degenerative conditions throughout the body, whether they involve the joints, the skin, or the heart, or really anywhere. So this really becomes very humbling, uh, at the same time, very, very empowering, because now that we focus on what is it that threatens the diversity of the gut bacteria, and beyond that, what can we do to reestablish this diversity? Suddenly, there is lots to do here, and that's a really good feeling. So I have one question about the butyrate. So I had heard this a while back, and I had cut out all dairy at one point, but then I started adding back in some ghee or grass-fed butter in small amounts. Um, is A lot of people ask us that. What are your thoughts about that? Oh, I, I think that ghee, which is clarified butter, uh, has uh, you know, been recently described as having very uh, powerful health properties. Recently means it was just 3,000 years ago that the literature started to appear. So ghee has been talked about in the Vedic texts as having right. profoundly uh, positive uh, health attributes, very uh, salubrious uh, thing to be consuming on multiple levels. First of all, ghee is a fat source of fuel. We really want to power the body with fat as opposed to sugar and carbohydrates. But beyond that, ghee is a form of butter and butter contains four to 6% butyrate. So not only do we rely on butyrate being produced by our gut bacteria as an important short chain fatty acid, but understand that we can get butyrate in its raw form uh, by consuming it. So uh, any, uh, uh, anything from cows is going to contain, well, milk uh, of cows as is ghee, is going to contain a significant amount of butyrate. We really wanna push that. Uh, the next uh, you know, thing to consider is that when you are on uh, what is called a ketogenic diet. And that means when you really have forced your body to uh, burn fat as opposed to sugar and carbohydrates as a fuel, and you're in what we call ketosis, which isn't that hard to achieve, one of the main ketones that your body produces that powers your body is called beta hydroxy butyrate, yet another source of butyrate. So we have really three avenues uh, that, that we can create this, uh, where we can create butyrate from our gut bacteria by nurturing them, by consuming butyrate, by eating things like butter, butter is back, and by restricting our carbohydrates and generally eating more healthful fats like extra virgin olive oil, coconut oil, uh, nuts and seeds, uh, pasture-raised uh, eggs, etc., wild fish. These uh, sources of good fats, while we restrict the carbs and sugar, push our bodies into ketosis, and we are producing three uh, ketones, acetate, uh, acetoacetate, and uh, beta-hydroxybutyrate. Uh, strictly, uh, by definition, actually beta-hydroxybutyrate isn't a ketone uh, by its chemical analysis, but we'll leave that for another day. That said, these uh, forms of butyrate serve as fuel for many of our body's cells. Uh, they also change our gene expression. They bind oh, certain, uh, certain uh, binding sites on our DNA. Uh, and they are what we call, I don't mean to be too technical here, but histone deacetylase inhibitors, a fancy term that means that they can amplify our gene expression to reduce inflammation, to increase our ability to detoxify and to increase our production of antioxidants. So, so if I That's could just... Why just really right. summarize that for people listening. So butyrate from butter or from doing a low carb, high fat um, ketogenic type of diet um, actually decreases inflammation. Yes. In your body. Right. And heals the gut. Infl inflammation. Well, let me and just jump in. Because we often. You're powering your brain cells with fat and not sugar. Okay. Uh, well, and I, I think 
you, you know, know I much have more a... efficiently. You're creating less free radicals. Uh, and it really is kind of the natural state that your brain wants to function on. You know, we all grew up at a time that we were told, oh, your brain needs glucose. And so you better eat right. a, a Snickers bar before you take your SAT. Right. Give your brain what it needs. And that's really, you know, that there's no science behind that. And, and we're really seeing a great uh, research from uh, people like Dr. Veach and others who are showing that the brain works much more efficiently when it's powered with fat. So okay. you know, we okay, should good. be fat heads. It's a good way to right. be. One of the concerns I have with dairy is the hormones and the antibiotics that they feed the cows along with how do you make cows fat? It's with grains. So grain fed so is, is that too much of a concern or? No, not at all. I think you are a thousand percent dialed in on that right. comment. And, you know, when you read books like uh, The China Study by right. Dr. Uh, Campbell and, and, you know, people say, well, Dr. Perlmutter, what do you think of that? I mean, after all, he's advocating uh, no consumption of meat or dairy uh, because of the health risks. What do I think about it? I think he's exactly dialed in. I agree with him. And that may surprise uh, your listeners. Why do I agree with them? Because I, I, I think that by and large, the meat uh, and the dairy that are used uh, by people and that really are part of the statistics that he used to come up with his conclusions are things that you've got to avoid. So uh, I, I'm not saying uh, go to the fast food and, and eat the burger or drink the milk that you get at the grocery store. That stuff's a good point. That stuff is deadly for you. It threatens your microbiome. And as you correctly point out, as an effort to fatten up the cattle, uh, they are given grain. They're finished with grain if they don't, don't get that their whole lives. But more importantly, what they're given is an antibiotic or two. Right. You know that when you give animals, humans included, antibiotics, you increase their fat production. Uh, a wonderful book by uh, Dr. Uh, Malcolm um, I'll think of it in a called Missing Microbes, Martin, Mark, Martin Blazer at NYU. Uh, he quite squarely points a finger at antibiotics as being strongly related to the increasing incidence of pediatric and adolescent obesity. Look, it happens in animals. It's been happening since the late 1950s. Change their microbiome, change their gut bacteria by giving them antibiotics. But they're going to get fat. Look around at our society right now. We're using antibiotics like candy knowing that 70% of the antibiotics used in America go into production of the food that we eat. Correct. And yet uh, people are scratching their heads saying, I can't understand why I'm still getting fat. I'm doing the best I can. I don't even drink soda anymore. I drink artificially flavored, uh, sweetened right. uh, soda. Well, okay. Uh, an amazing study was published about a month ago showing a dramatic increased risk of obesity in people who consume artificially sweetened beverages, squarely pointing a finger again at changes in the gut bacteria that are brought on uh, by consuming th this type of chemical. Wow. So let's just summarize, and then we're going to continue with more podcasts with Dr. Perlmutter. If you want a healthy gut, you want a healthy brain, so you have to have a healthy gut, what are three things to avoid and three things to do? So when we talk about a healthy gut, we're talking about diversity of species. We want to have every piece of the orchestra playing uh, its part so that we get a symphony. And that said, uh, if you want to have a healthy gut, you've got to eat a good diversity of food, but it should be focused on the tenets of higher fat, lower carbs, and much higher levels of prebiotic fiber. Not just fiber, but a specific type of fiber to nurture the gut bacteria. It's called prebiotic fiber. Foods rich in prebiotic fiber include a jicama, which is Mexican yam, a chicory root, a garlic, onions, leeks, and my favorite, dandelion greens, and others, artichoke, asparagus, etc. cetera. Uh, the other thing to recognize, some new research has demonstrated a strong correlation between diversity of gut bacteria and aerobic exercise, who knew? So we've been popularizing uh, aerobic exercise for years because of its effect in terms of growing new brain cells. Now we're seeing literature that demonstrates increased diversity of gut bacteria in people who engage in that activity. Now, 
that is a correlative study. It means they showed people who get a lot of exercise have an increased diversity. It doesn't mean that aerobic exercise necessarily will improve your gut diversity. I think that it will. Now, in terms of things to avoid, we sort of covered that already. A diet that is higher in sugar needs to be avoided. Artificial sweeteners are deadly towards the gut bacteria. Not getting aerobic exercise, I think, is very important. But I think beyond that, we've really got to begin to see and embrace the notion that drugs really matter. Obviously, antibiotics are devastating towards the gut bacteria. Some wonderful uh, research out of Denmark shows that even one course of antibiotics increases a person's risk for type 2 diabetes based upon changes in the gut bacteria by 50%. And it's a dose-related correlation. The more antibiotics you receive, the higher is your risk for type wow. 2 diabetes. So for people who have had to take antibiotics, what can they do? Just take some probiotics? Well, I think that's an excellent question. Uh, I do um, know that uh, you know there's some significant improvement in the gut uh, that can happen when people then get back on the program. Okay. Uh, however, uh, any course of antibiotics changes the gut bacteria permanently. So... This notion of deciding to go and have a Z-Pack or whatever you want to have because you have a cold needs to be rethought because there are lifelong consequences of every exposure to antibiotics. But I think that boosting your prebiotic uh, fiber is key and it does allow regeneration of the good species that are uh, with antibiotics might have been suppressed, but they're still there. They're still ready to help you. We just got to give them what they want. You know, um, We say when a woman is pregnant that she's got to be careful now because she's eating for two. And I often say, look, every one of us is eating for a hundred trillion. That's the number of (laughs) microbes in your gut that are waiting for dinner. Your pets. And what are you going to give them? Because they control your health destiny. Yeah, we tell our daughter that she needs to feed the pets in her gut because they're like protection dogs, you know, you have to feed them because they protect you back. So... All right, or we have, we have to stop today. Here, they're, they're taking care of us. Right, exactly. But we are going to continue with Dr. Perlmutter. Stay with us. <laughs> 